yeah, I don't know how many of you were here last week, but I, I too was, uh, was really impressed, actually. I, was sort of, I felt proud. I felt really proud to be part of Sanganite, raising all that money just in one evening with, I think it was less than 50 people. We raised uh, 1,000 uh and 51 pounds uh isn't that fantastic um uh and it's and it's 1200 uh to uh um required to um um translate a book into polish which is what we're doing and it might be that some people some people accidentally forgot in which case we'll even we might even make still make the uh, the full uh target but anyway i was just really proud of that actually i thought that was brilliant um yeah, so well done, well done you, well done us. Um, <clears throat> and partly we wanted to do that within this uh, series uh, as a way of exploring an experience. You know, we can talk about dana, can't we? But actually it's a matter of doing. Um, yeah, so what was that, what was that like? So we wanted to, to um, um, yeah, offer an opportunity uh, to give. Um, uh, before sort of talking about um, giving in a way. So yeah, tonight what I want to do is I want to talk about a path of giving. Um, <clears throat> I always sort of got the notion that giving was a sort of preliminary. It was sort of something you get, you get, you do before really getting started. Uh, and um, <clears throat> yeah, so in a way I'm wanting to address my own, <laughs> uh, my own previous sort of uh, misunderstandings. Um, and I, um, I'd like to do that through talking about uh, the the, uh, the Bodhisattva. Um, so you may or may not have heard of um, <clears throat> the Bodhisattva, uh, but the Bodhisattva is a later restate re later restatement of the Buddhist ideal. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this restatement makes explicit the sort of dynamism and altruism uh, that is visibly there uh, in the Buddha's life after his enlightenment, well before as well, but uh, after his enlightenment. It makes that, it makes that really explicit. Um, <clears throat> so it's explicitly sort of altruistic and it, it's explicitly dynamic. Um, and this is really, really important, isn't it? Because um, the, the goal, what we're aiming to do, uh, if our goal is sort of really still and um peaceful uh but actually what it requires to get there is loads of energy uh then if we think about where we're where we're where we're trying to go if we're sort of inspired by something that's very still it's sort of gonna it's not gonna gonna sort of help us uh that much it helps to sort of see the goal um to be inspired by a goal that sort of um <clears throat> articulates uh, what we need to do uh now so the, the Bodhisattva was a sort of later restatement of what was just implicit um, uh, in earlier Buddhism. It's there in the example of the life of the Buddha. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, there's a little picture, an image of a Bodhisattva. You, you'll probably sort of see them, uh, sort of recognize them. Um, <clears throat> so, um, it still begs the question, what on earth is a bodhisattva? What on earth is a bodhisattva? You can see the images, the pictures, but uh, what is a bodhisattva? And um, <clears throat> I, uh, I came across this, um, this section um, um, in a, uh, at the beginning of a seminar about uh, the bodhisattva, uh, where Sangharakshitas He's saying, um, in a way, it's not quite true to say that the Bodhisattva uh, is altruistic um, <clears throat> in, uh, in distinction against uh, individualism, spiritual individualism. Uh, he's, he says um, <clears throat> that that, in a way, is a sort of, um, it's a helpful restatement, but it's just not quite true. Um, So in talking about what the Bodhisattva is, he says, what you do rather is to adopt an attitude in which the terms self and others have become meaningless. So you adopt an attitude in which the terms self 
and others have become meaningless. Uh, and he goes on to say that he doesn't mean that there's nothing uh, distinct between you and I. Um, so uh, just practically speaking, right now I'm wiggling my toes. This is something Machabandu says. Uh, I'm not wiggling your toes. It's not working, is it? Uh, I can't wiggle your toes. So there's something clearly distinct uh, between you and me, between self and other. Um, <clears throat> so he's not, he doesn't mean it's meaningless in that sense. It clearly uh, indicates something. Um, but what, he, what he's saying is uh, that they are dialectically related. Yeah, so if we're trying to get to the truth of what self is, um, we inevitably uh, find other. Uh, if we're trying to get to the truth of what other is, uh, we inevitably um, come across self. We have to talk, we have to include in some way uh, self. You don't need to, you don't need to nut that out. You might still be reflecting on that. But the, um, the interesting bit, bit that I really like to comes now, which is so that in doing good to yourself, you do good to others. And in doing good to others, you do good to yourself. The one continually passing over into the other in such a way as to suggest a state beyond both self and other. So that really, really struck me. I'll just read it again. So that in doing good to yourself, you do good to others. In doing good to others, you do good to yourself. The one continually passing over into the other in such a way as to suggest a state beyond both self and other. So that's what the Bodhisattva is. The Bodhi Bodhisattva dwells in that state. Um, or the realized bodhisattva, uh, the goal of the, uh, uh, the bodhisattva path um, is sort of dwelling in that state. So um, bearing that in mind as, as the goal, what I wanted to do was sort of in a way investigate that, investigate that goal through talking about um, <clears throat> the path, a path of giving. And I thought, I thought I'd talk about it in terms of sort of ethics, meditation, and wisdom, just in that very well-known structure of the whole path of ethics, meditation, and wisdom. So I want to sort of investigate uh, this idea of in doing good to yourself, you do good to others, and vice versa, um, in the area of ethics, uh, and then in the area of meditation, and then in the area of wisdom. So I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> I've had to, uh, uh, I had to change the structure of my talk very late on uh, so, so that my notes don't fully represent what I need to talk about. So uh, bear with me. If I fall down a hole, uh, <laughs> listen with sympathetic ears. <laughs> so in doing good to yourself, you do good to others. In doing good to others, you do good to yourself. Um, <clears throat> In the air, how is that true, sort of, um, in this area of ethics? Well, um, <clears throat> I immediately thought of stuff that I've read, a book I've read uh, called Happiness by Richard Layard. Um, and uh, that book um, mainly concludes that actually happiness um, is based in connection. Um, connection is a kind of key element uh, to our, our happiness. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just an, another little quote from Sangharakshita. Uh, firstly, giving or generosity is the way in which we connect in the most practical manner with others. We let go of our tight grip on what belongs to us, whether material goods, money, time, or energy. That which expresses our possessiveness is transformed into a means of expressing its complete opposite. So uh, I think that's, that's fairly, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? The way we connect uh, at a very basic level uh, is through, if you want to connect with someone, you spend time with them, you give some of your time. 
uh, you give uh, things, um, <clears throat> you give your energy, your attention. Attention requires energy, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> um, so, yeah, just a very basic level. Um, our happiness seems to be sort of dependent on this. Uh, that's what the, the, the research uh, shows that actually uh, if we live um, in a narrowed down way that's focused just on self, just on looking after self, um, <clears throat> we get unhappy. Uh, actually, we need to sort of modulate uh, between these two, um, these two perspectives, if you like. Um, so that's particularly what I want to look at in doing good to yourself. So we can kind of focus on doing good to ourself um, and then we can modulate um, to doing good uh, to others, uh, doing good, yeah, to others. Um, <clears throat> so I think, um, I think there's a lot in this. I think, um, I was thinking about Sangonite actually, I think it's very easy to sort of go through your, go through your life and not notice. Well, perhaps before that, I think, I think the main thing I wanted to do was just ask, you know, how is our life set up? How are our routines set up? What's our week like? Is it mainly about me um, or is there a sort of modulation uh, between now I put energy in to sort of benefit me, now I put energy in to benefit others? Um, I thought this just this very basic level of thinking about ethics was re is really, really interesting uh, for us to do, you know, perhaps particularly uh, because of our society and you know, our society sort of is set up uh, to promote uh, an individualistic sort of uh, life so just just thinking in this way um, of sort of modulating between the two um, and this being this being part of the the the, uh, the way of exploring this bodhisattva uh, life um, <clears throat> sangharachta says uh, the bodhisattva ideal you is the heartbeat uh, you put your hand on the very heart of buddhism uh, well, I, I was thinking about the kind of the double beat of the heart that surely is uh, benefit self, benefit other, benefit self, benefit other. Unless we uh, engage with both of those, um, our spiritual life, um, well, actually, just at this level, we won't be very happy, but our spiritual life won't be alive um, So in the area of um, in the area of uh, classes, uh, I was just thinking because people were asking sort of how can I give? Uh, one way in which we give is just turning up to classes. Now that might seem a bit sort of easy, but it, it's it's really significant. I've just been noticing you guys turning up this evening. Uh, that makes a difference to me. Um, we might come thinking, oh, I'm going to get something out of this. Um, it's only a short sort of shift in attitude to come thinking oh, well, maybe I can engage with this to benefit people. It's only a sort of little step away. Um, so I think the more we become aware of this perspective of how can I benefit self, how can I benefit other, and modulating between those two, the more we can see the opportunities in our life just to sort of shift our attitude um, in, the, in the activities that we do and really make a difference. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it necessarily needs to be grand. And I suspect this is happening all the time in our lives, but we can sort of take it up um, as, you know, as a sort of conscious practice to sort of modulate between these two. This is what I've been uh, doing and exploring. I think it's really, really interesting, slightly sort of simplified way of thinking about ethics, but I think it's really, really interesting. Uh, so we're exploring how, how are we spending our time uh, how are we spending our energy, uh, our money, all that sort of stuff? Um, is it all focused on self? Are there, what are the opportunities to be uh, giving to others? Um, <clears throat> and the, 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 um, the research says we will become happier. Uh, we will become happier through doing that. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit like happiness, maybe it's a bit cheesy, but it's a bit like happiness is not uh, sort of um, uh, purchasable in kind of uh, individual wrappings. It's a bulk buy. We have to think, I think this is Richard Layard who wrote that book. We have to think uh, not how can I be happy, but how can we be happy? Uh, that way we're actually more likely to be happier. 
uh, because it includes others. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I was thinking of an experience of this myself. I've been, um, as many people, exploring baking uh, in lockdown, and uh, I made some scones, some really cracking scones. Um, yeah, uh, very, very manly scones, very heroic scones. Uh, <laughs> um, and it was great because I really enjoyed making them. Uh, and then the people who ate them really enjoyed uh, eating them. There's one there nodding. Um, and I enjoyed them enjoying them. And then we all had a bit of a laugh about it. I was spending time uh, with my girlfriend and, and Arta Priya uh, texted me and said, no, those were really good. And then he texted me later and he said, no, seriously, I think you need to get right back. You, you need to get back here right now and start baking some more scones. And we were just, it just sort of led to this sort of, this, uh, you know, this lovely, sort of rich, uh, fun kind of um, atmosphere. A little thing like that uh, sort of uh, overflowed in all sorts of ways. I think it's true we could be much, much happier than we are. I believe that, I believe that. Uh, I believe happiness is not actually uh, that difficult. Um, <clears throat> and so that, yeah, that's what I wanted to explore. Just, just conversely, um, self-preoccupation. It's probably an occupational hazard uh, of an introspective life, isn't it? Uh, we can slip over into self-preoccupation, um, perhaps particularly in our sort of psychologically uh, enlightened sort of age. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we need to, as Buddhists, we need to watch out for that. Are we understanding the Buddhist life in individualistic terms and falling into kind of self-preoccupation? Um, <clears throat> uh, I was really moved by this um, thing I saw on TV. Um, I think it's called Our Pets and Us. Uh, they'd gone into a prison. Um, lots of people in really bad states. Um, and uh, they had asked them if they wanted to help train dogs, guide dogs. And... Um, you could see the effect, it transformed their lives. Uh, one of the guys wrote at the end, my life is no longer the same. Uh, I, I'm, um, how did he put it? Uh, my life is not just about me anymore. Isn't that brilliant? That was just a dog. Um, no amount of psychology could kind of change his life actually. It wasn't possible, but actually just looking after a pet. Um, I think that for me is an image of self-preoccupation in a way, the sort of prison of self-preoccupation. We can get sort of stuck in self-preoccupation. Actually, stepping out is, is, uh, is, uh, is a tiny step away, just doing something uh, for someone else. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I've been exploring this um, uh, how can we be happy thing. Just, and I found it, found it very useful. But one thing I found about it is that actually I'm not moved by happiness. Uh, I mean, I am moved, I'm moved in the Metabhavna by it, but in terms of a sort of vision uh, for life, happiness isn't quite enough for me. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, it gets, in our society, I think it gets too sort of caught up, too entangled with success. It's been sort of franchised, hasn't it, happiness in some ways? Uh, by success. Um, I find it more helpful to think in terms of fulfillment. I think the other thing about happiness, Viktor Frankl talks about this, is it's a byproduct. Um, but if I think in terms of fulfillment, I find that moving, uh, I find that engaging. So this whole thing about in doing good to yourself, um, it's more about fulfillment than happiness. Um, so Buddhism does have a vision beyond happiness, uh, a vision of fulfillment. And um, so moving on to the next area of meditation uh, now, um, <clears throat> as a sort of um, exploration of that. So we've got the image of the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha's eyes are closed or half closed. It's an image of the mind, uh, isn't it? It's an image 
uh, an introspective uh, image or largely introspective image. It's an image of a transformed mind. Um, <clears throat> and it's also an image without a God. Uh, so it's a sort of self-realized image. Um, so this is a sort of image of meditation where meditation can lead. Um, <clears throat> uh, so how is it that um, uh, in meditation, in doing good to ourselves, you do good to others? That's, that's what I want to explore. Um, so the whole, the whole basis of this self-realization is karma. Uh, it's, um, <clears throat> so karma being intention, uh, based in intention, intentional action. So it comes from the mind. Um, <clears throat> karma originates in the mind. Uh, and what the Buddha was saying was our intentional action, it modifies consciousness. Uh, so that um, is there within the image of the Buddha, within the image of meditation. And uh, as we know, it's basically saying that if we act um, with a mind motivated by grasping, that modifies consciousness towards more grasping. And we can see how that is never going to lead to peace, to happiness. Um, if we modify our mind to grasp more, whatever we've got in the process of grasping is not going to be enough for that grasping mind. That grasping mind is going to grasp what need to, uh, by its own nature, grasp after something else. Uh, so that's one direction that karma takes us. And then conversely, giving also modifies consciousness. Um, <clears throat> so uh, giving, um, yeah, so giving, uh, it leads to, uh, it cultivates a generous, open state of mind. Um, and Sangha actually says, what better incentive for cultivating a generous, open state of mind than knowing it will lead to even more positive states uh, and ultimately to enlightenment. So this is the sort of uh, the vision of meditation that actually um, um, it's, it's, um, it's a kind of progressive vision that actually um, if we act according to karma in certain ways, uh, we can develop more positive states and out of that even more positive states um, that sort of goes uh, very strongly against our kind of assumptions about the world doesn't it um, it goes against the kind of um, exchange or recompense kind of um, unconscious assumption that is the basis of our social world um, that's what i find i find when i give i'm unconsciously thinking I'm going to get something back if I receive something. I'm unconsciously thinking, "Oh, well, they'll, you know, they'll want something back." It's it's never it's never very conscious, uh, but it's there. Um, <clears throat> so me so uh, meditation, uh, due to karma, is this sort of vision of a progressive. Um, it's a progressive vision of giving. So when we give. Uh, we develop even more generosity. Um, it can go further and further and further. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so basically giving, um, from Buddhist point of view, is its own reward. Uh, that's really what's been got at uh, with giving. Um, it's quite profound, that, isn't it? But it's also sort of subtly sort of counterculture. It subtly throws us off. Is that really true? Um, <clears throat> and that is because uh, it certainly throws us off because we're so, so used to um, exchange. Uh, now I'll, I'll uh, talk about my own experience with this. Um, uh, when I heard about this sort of uh, as, a, as, a, as a young Buddhist kind of hearing about the idea of dana, I thought, okay, well, I'll try that out. I'll try it out, see what it's like. Uh, and so I, I gave, um, and um, it didn't do what I, what I wanted it to do. Uh, it didn't seem to sort of deliver 
uh, on the karmic reward. I was sort of, in a way, can you see, I was still in that sort of exchange mentality. Um, if I give, then I'll get even more open, positive, generous states. That was the sort of mind that I was in, uh, I have to admit. Um, I didn't quite go as far as sort of giving them a gift and then feeling when it didn't work, sort of wanting to take it back. But that was the sort of mind, that was the kind of mindset really that I was in, but I couldn't quite see that. So really giving is a practice. It's a practice of developing more and more self-awareness. Um, and that's why I talk about it as meditation. Meditation, we're, we're really starting to become much more aware of the mind uh, and therefore our mixed motives, our mixed intentions. Um, and I think we need to be careful when we do this. Um, we need to embrace our mixed, um, our mixed motives, uh, not be sort of judgmental, punitive. Uh, we need to embrace them. It's good that we're becoming aware of them. Um, in becoming aware of them, there's an opportunity to do something uh, different. So it's a bit of a practice, but just becoming aware of the extent to which our generosity uh, is riddled with sort of mixed uh, motives. Um, <clears throat> so as well as kind of, uh, as well as sort of embracing in a way our mixed motives, we can keep, stay inspired by a vision of something possible beyond that, a vision that we can actually give. Um, not, out, not on the basis of exchange. Uh, it is possible to do that. Um, and if we can stay open to that, we might at some point actually do that. I think it is rare. I think it is rare that we do that. I speak for myself. Um, so I think, yeah, we want to embrace with sort of kindly humor. We can kind of laugh at ourselves on mixed motives. Um, don't get in a, a punitive state uh, about them. That really won't help. In, in fact, it will cover over with more um, unhelpful uh, mental states, the possibility that we're trying to um, uh, benefit uh, from, the possibility of giving with a purer motive. So I'd, I'd, I'd encourage us in this area to sort of play at Dharma. Um, don't take yourself too seriously. You will have mixed motives, but play at it. Just sort of give here, give there. Um, and notice what the effect is like. I, um, a few months ago, I, I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll buy, the, uh, buy the film. We're gonna watch a film uh, in the community here. I said, I'll buy it. And I did it because um, uh, usually we watch other people's films that other people have bought. And afterwards I felt this kind of flat feeling. <laughs> I'd just done it out of guilt. I thought, I don't usually pay for films. <laughs> uh, I ought to do that. And it, le it led to this sort of flat uh, kind of feeling, uh, as opposed to um, when we give with a pure motive, this expansion, uh, this, uh, this experience that giving is its own reward that I experienced with the scones. I just really enjoyed doing that. Um, so in this area of meditation, we can really enjoy um, our genuine giving. We can enjoy the experience uh, if we allow ourselves to give ourselves the time to reflect on what is the experience that arises uh, from our giving. And we can also embrace our mixed motives. Um, <clears throat> but I, I believe actually that uh, in another way we need um, to be in our meditations, uh, obviously we need to be um, expressing this outside of our meditation. So we're, we're working inside our meditation, doing good to self, but then expressing it outside, doing good to others. But I think in another way, this um, um, interchange of doing good to self and other is, is true. I find that in order to have confidence uh, that I can give, purely give, uh, I need uh, I need to see it actually I need uh, to have that confidence regularly I need to see it uh, see it in other people or at least it's when I see it in other people when I experience it from other people uh, that it sort of it nudges me on it encourages me um, 
I was thinking of Padmavadra in this respect, his hospitality, so, so, so generous. Um, I sort of, I notice him receiving his welcome to the retreat center Padmaloka. I sort of want to give something back and I find that I can't, I'm sort of set, I'm stuck within this, this sort of exchange um, mentality. And then I go, oh yeah, that's right. That's, that's what we're meant to be doing, isn't it? Um, uh, but I think, I think uh, really uh, friendship, uh, that's where we're moving towards friendship, to, to really sort of have a genuine, a confident sense of other people's motives. We need to get to know them. We need to have dealings with them. Um, it's hard to get to know people's motives. So uh, you need to sort of have dealings with them. So in a way you need to engage with people, um, engage with people at the Buddhist center to get to know them uh, in order to be inspired uh, to go beyond uh, your mixed motives. That's certainly my experience anyway. <clears throat> So that's the area of meditation, how there's this sort of mutuality uh, between doing good to yourself uh, and doing good to others. Um, and then wisdom. So this is, this is, as you probably know, a progressive path. Um, ethics, you can't really separate meditation out from ethics because in Buddhism, intention is central to ethics um, <clears throat> um, but yeah I want to move on to talk about wisdom so with wisdom I'd I'd really encourage you uh, this is what I've been doing uh, encourage you to, to reflect on your experience of giving I think um, we might think of wisdom as sort of reading books and it certainly does involve study um, but uh, also reflecting uh, on our experience of giving. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm just wondering which, which quote to read now actually. Um, Yeah, so I suppose we're um, uh, we're coming we're coming back to this uh, this idea that self and other it's possible to adopt an attitude uh, in which self and other have become meaningless. Um, <clears throat> so that in doing good to yourself, you do good to others. In doing good to others, you do good to yourself. The one continually passing over into the other in such a way as to suggest a state beyond both self and other. Well, that, that state um, is the sort of subject of wisdom. Um, <clears throat> so that's what I want to talk about. Um, but I believe we can kind of reflect on our actual experience of giving uh, to do that, to explore that. Um, <clears throat> So, um, another little quote um, that, that uh, I found very, very relevant here about the Bodhisattva. So, whoever longs to rescue quickly both themselves and others should practice the supreme mystery, exchange of self and other. Whoever longs to rescue both themselves and others should practice the supreme mystery, exchange of self and other. So I, I found that really striking um, that we're practicing something, something that is a supreme mystery. Now mystery we can't understand. Uh, all we're left with in the face of mystery is wonder. We can just wonder at it. And uh, recently I was listening to a talk by Ratnaguna, a quite brilliant talk actually, really fascinating, um, where he was proposing that actually insight or Buddhist wisdom uh, could be a state of wonder, a state of perpetual wonder. Quite an interesting sort of idea. <clears throat> um, and uh, 
he went on to quote uh, um, this this really uh, brilliant quote. I haven't got the writer actually, but if you're if you're interested, do go and look at his talk. It's on the Manchester Buddhist Buddhist Centre website. But he talked of wonder as uh, in this book. Uh, wonder is the sudden awareness that no mere fact can possibly adequate possibly be an adequate explanation of the mystery in which one finds oneself immersed at every moment. I'll just read that again because there's quite a lot to it, uh, just so you can sort of soak it in. Uh, wonder is a sudden awareness that no mere fact can possibly be an adequate explanation of the mystery in which one finds oneself immersed at every moment. So I was really struck by that. Um, <clears throat> no mere fact uh, can possibly be an adequate explanation of the mystery in which one finds oneself immersed at every moment. Isn't that beautiful? Really beautiful uh, um, bit of writing. So the everyday facts of self and other, the sort of household fact of self and other, um, <clears throat> cannot possibly be explained uh, by those terms, yeah? Um, <clears throat> so they're far more mysterious. Uh, and this is what we experience. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you turn towards your experience, you can kind of see this. Um, I've been really struck by this, uh, giving, when you give, when you do, you do eventually give, you know, without sort of mixed motives or uh, with, with uh, uh, pretty pure motives. Um, it's extraordinary, kind of quite what happens. Uh, somehow I discover that I need other people. Uh, I need other people to be more wholly myself. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's completely counterintuitive. I find that I've become more wholly myself by forgetting about myself and giving to others. And conversely, uh, the mystery is, is such that um, by being more wholly myself, uh, I benefit others. So these two household, household facts <laughs> of self and other um, do not go anywhere to sort of explaining the mystery in which we find ourselves immersed at every, at every moment. Um, and that is, we can, re we can actually turn towards our experience and sort of reflect on this, um, actually see it in experience. And I think we really need to do that. Um, uh, we need to, we need to uh, do that uh, to take confidence in it. Um, what, we can discover is the Bodhisattva is not merely a picture on a book. Uh, it's not a sort of superhero that lives in cartoon uh, books or on pictures on war. The Bodhisattva is a possibility uh, inherent in consciousness. That's really what it is in your consciousness, in my consciousness. So we can actually um, act and through giving, through this kind of moving between uh, this sort of heartbeat of modifying to doing good to self, doing good to others, uh, reflect on our experience and discover uh, that actually it's far more mysterious. Uh, it's far more mysterious than it would seem. So uh, we can find that because the Bodhisattva is not just an idea. Uh, it's a possibility uh, natural to consciousness. Um, <clears throat> So this is really, really important because um, uh, our world is reflecting back to us um, that uh, self uh, is really uh, something that needs to monopolize resources. Uh, the self, uh, that sort of, that's the vision, our consumerist vision of the world. What the Bodhisattva is, is proof that that's not the case. Um, <clears throat> proof that actually, uh, if we give and we do good to others, if we move, modulate between these two, we go deeper and deeper into the resources of the mind. Um, we discover 
uh, we discover the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva, um, uh, which is the sort of limitless resources really of the mind. Uh, and that is a progressive discovery. Uh, it's a sustainable discovery whereby um, uh, the more you, as I was saying with meditation, the more you give, the more generous and open uh, mind gets. That's actually the nature um, of consciousness um, to uh, be deep, limitless uh, resource. So that's a radically different sort of vision um, from the one that our world sort of reflects uh, back to us, one of little beings needing to sort of monopolize, squabbling over resources. And you can see how it's a vision uh, that the world sort of badly needs uh, in this um, day and age. It's something that doesn't just exist in books. We can approach it, we can uh, discover it in our experience. Um, <clears throat> So I hope, I hope I've sort of outlined in a, a sort of a, a full path of giving through ethics uh, where we can kind of look at sort of modulating uh, between these two ways of using our time and energy um, in our life. Perhaps in the groups we can discuss that. What's the sort of shape of your life? Is, does it have a predominance in one way or another? Are you predominantly giving to others and actually you need to uh, benefit self um, in order to benefit those others uh, more fully. Um, and then there's the whole area of um, embracing our mixed motives um, <clears throat> and cultivating um, those positive uh, intentions, those skillful intentions, uh, the area of meditation. Uh, and then also um, this area of wonder I'd say sort of giving in wonder, that's been my experience, um, that giving uh, in wonder uh, comes close to this, this um, practicing the supreme mystery of exchange of self and other. We can kind of give in wonder uh, and in so doing be taken out of uh, the limiting um, uh, language of self and other into the mystery uh, of life.